Hello everyone, it's Richard here. This is a video to give some initial thoughts and reactions to the Ultimaker 3 launch today. So I couldn't actually get to the launch. I did get an invite down to London uh, for the launch event, but I was up way up in the, up the country and couldn't get back down in time to London. So I had to do what everyone else did and wait for the event to happen and follow it on Twitter, which was quite useful because that was one of the best places actually to get the information from mainly because Ultimaker's website crashed with everyone updating and trying to find the information. So apart from that slight hiccup, Ultimaker did manage to launch the Ultimaker 3 and the Ultimaker 3 Extended today quite successfully all around the world and they had quite a few launch events uh, unveiling the machine. There doesn't seem to be many machines out in the wild, although Matter Hackers have already got one and they seem to have been using it for a little while, at least got a feel for it and have a video up on YouTube which I'll link to in the description below. So we found out a little bit more about the Ultimaker 3. It was one of the worst kept secrets in the industry to be honest but at least we know some more of the facts and details now and can talk a little bit more about what Ultimaker are thinking with this machine and where they might be going with some of the technologies in there. So first of all, the actual physical size of the machine is not a lot different to the Ultimaker 2. You've got a little bit different build area, but nothing significant to write home about. And the Ultimaker 3 Extended is a bit like the Ultimaker 2 Extended, so you've got a little bit of extra height there. The main difference really, uh, they haven't actually removed the Bowden system, so we've still got 3mm materials, we've still got Bowden tubes feeding into hot ends. I say hot ends because we've got two now, and that's the main difference with the Ultimaker 2. It's designed to run with two materials at once, or a lot of people are reporting it at once, but it's not. It's obviously one at a time, printing a material and a support material, or two compatible materials together, or two different colours. So that's the main thing, and I speculated on this a little while ago, how they might do that, especially if they didn't change the gantry system that they've got on the XY, because actually putting two print heads on that sort of system with those nozzles um, is going to cause a lot of problems. But actually Ultimaker have done a sensible way of jogging the nozzles up and down. I don't know quite how they've achieved that yet. I will be very, very, very impressed if they've achieved it without using a little servo or a motor or some other type of actuator. If they've done it mechanically, I'll be really thumbs up super impressed if they've managed to do it. So you jiggle the head to the side where it parks and does the purge for the material, if that can actually uh, change a mechanism so the head jiggles up and down on each side, I'll be really, really impressed. I hope they haven't gone to the extra trouble of adding extra server motors or anything like that because that's just technology for the sake of it and we don't need extra expense and technology to go wrong. So if they've done it mechanically, I'm going to be really impressed. If they haven't, nah, not so impressed, but at least they've got those heads moving up and down and they jiggle out of the way of each other. So you use the first one with your first material and then you may use one with support materials or other colours or other physical materials. So the next thing there is the support material and this is the thing I was really really interested in. I knew it was coming but I wanted to find out exactly what their plan was. Unfortunately it's just PVA. It seems to be really just PVA, not modified PVA or special support material PVA that they've spent ages developing, it's just PVA. and. That's actually probably one of my biggest disappointments, that it's just PVA. Now, they do say they've spent a lot of time uh, changing the thermal profiles of the extruders, so they ramp up and down and don't sit too, uh, too long at the hot end, high temperatures to destroy PLA, and that's been the problem we've seen on other machines, that if it sits too long at 195 or more degrees C, you get problems with degradation of the material, and it blocks and grinds and causes all sorts of other things. But PVA is not just PVA. I've had lots of experience with PVA and I've stopped using it about eight months ago. So the best PVA I ever found was actually Orbitech, which was pretty good and I haven't even used this roll. I also used some eSun, which is a little different and actually slightly softer. I didn't really get on very well with the eSun, but it does, it does work, but only for short prints I found. The big problem with PVA is it absorbs moisture. And when you get a lot of moisture, it sort of does this and gets almost a little bit slimy and you can't really you can't really fix it, you can't really sort it, you can't really resurrect it. So it sort of tends to go like that after even some period of time just sat out in the open. And that's the biggest problem that 
doesn't seem to have been re readdressed. I did actually ask Ultimaker on Twitter directly what are the issues with it sat out in the open and they said they recommend you taking the spool of PVA out uh, after each print and putting it back and storing it safely. So you can't really just leave it in the machine, which is a bit of a shame. It would have been nice if they had done something to the PVA um, along the lines of um, what E3D have done with Scaffold. And Scaffold's been my support material of choice for the last eight months or so now. It's still not perfect, it's still got some issues, it's still PVA based, it just works a little bit better, doesn't grind as much, doesn't cause so many problems as PVA on its own. But we will have to wait and see. To be honest, no one has experienced the Ultimaker 3 support material in use and the, the products they've shown that they've printed have been quite lengthy prints. So with any luck, fingers crossed, we might actually see a support material system that is working a lot better, even if it is just with the normal PVA. How much they're going to charge for that PVA, who knows. Whether you can use alternative PVAs, I'd be very suspicious whether you could just put any old PVA in there and it'll work. A PVA needs a very specific way of clamping, driving, retractions, all sorts of things cause PVA to either grind in the filament me in the extruder mechanism or get clogged in the nozzle or all sorts of things. So we will have to wait and see exactly what they do there. So that's the size of the machine. We've got a few other features. They've got rid of the SD card socket on the front and we've now got a USB port, which is really nice. It's uh, what you'd expect in this day and age. You're, um, having SD cards, just a bit of a throwback from uh, the old days of Arduinos and the original rep wraps where it was much easier to read an SD card than it was a full uh, USB interface because we didn't have that available in a lot of the electronics. So they've obviously upgraded the electronics got a decent display as well in there and a little menu system that looks quite nice. That they've also done a US um, a ethernet and wireless system. So you can just plug it into your network and we haven't I haven't actually seen what the interface is whether it's a web page interface or other, something else but we will see more details on that I'm sure. And the wireless system is sort of to be expected if you're going to do um, uh, an ethernet system in there so you may as well do wireless as well. So we've got some other slight changes on the hot end, which looks like what they've done is they've made them semi-smart, if you like. Not really. They've basically just made them a small cartridge with all of the hot end um, and the nozzle and all of the connections on a small little plate that just clicks in and makes the connections mm -hmm. through to the electronics, which is quite nice because you can just snap fit these in and they say that they're going to bring out different modules to fit in there. Um, so that's the sort of quick fit uh, extruder, or should I say nozzle. The extruder is still round the back, it's still bowed and fed, and it's still pushing 3mm filament through the plastic tube, which is another bit of a disappointment for me. I would have liked the whole gantry system to have changed on the Ultimaker 3, to have a more robust um, way of driving direct extruders with the filament going straight into them. But that hasn't happened, so we'll have to wait for maybe Ultimaker 3 Plus or maybe 4. We'll see if they ever do change that gantry system. So that's the main features and changes to the Ultimaker 3. Uh, let me think whether there's anything else that is of significance. Oh, noise. Ask them about noise because there wasn't really that much people talking about the noise level and it's around 50 decibels which doesn't really mean anything unless you get a distance involved and that's quite subjective depending on what rooms you're in and in a normal office environment, it's not going to be too bad. Uh, certainly quieter than a lot of the machines, <coughs> Sigma. Uh, but that's, you know, hopefully going to be addressed on some of those other machines as well. Um, and anything we can do to reduce noise on a 3D printer is a very good thing. So they've put a nominal figure of 50 dB. We will see what that actually means in reality when fans are going and things are moving around and uh, extrusion is being happening. So there's that. And there was one other thing that I can't remember now. Oh yeah, it's got a auto build plate. I think it's more of an intelligent system to level your plate, maybe some mesh leveling in there, that sort of thing, and to allow you to adjust uh, the leveling of the plate. So not quite sure because I wasn't at the presentation. So I'm just getting this through what everyone's been saying on Twitter and everything else. I think their website is back up running now so you should be able to get all the information about it. There does seem to be plenty places around on the internet that have got features. They obviously did this as a big PR campaign as well which is nice. I just hope they haven't spent all of their 15 million 
euros or dollars, whatever it was, on launching this new machine. And there's a little bit in reserve there to actually carry on with further development. I'm sure there is. Uh, but we'll have to wait and see. The other thing, the smart materials, they do have slightly different size spools now and they have a NFC uh, smart chip on them. Uh, that's basically just to, as far as I can tell, to keep the information about the type of material. So if it's PVA material, it'll give all the data in um, to the system on that material and auto calibrate your print settings that you'll need to process the material. And again, that's very clever, but actually I would have been much more impressed uh, if they'd have used the onboard camera that's also there now that you can monitor the print with to just scan a QR code or a barcode because adding extra technology for the sake of it is just really annoying. The smart thing to, for, to for all engineering to, engineers to do is to work out a simple way to do these things and not add technology just for the sake of it. So yes, it's got a very clever wireless NFC connector that you clip on and they're embedded into the spools, these little chips, and I'm sure they don't cost a great deal, but there's something else, more electronics have to be put into these spools, when actually a paper cardboard spool with a printed label on it, with human readable characters, it's PLA, you should run it at 195 degrees C, and also a QR code or a barcode that could have just been quickly scanned by the printer itself, you could have just held it in front of the, the camera, and the camera could have just scanned that and said beep, I know what to do now, I know what material you're going to load into me. So that would have been my smart way of doing it. And all that has been talked about on the forums and various chat rooms and things for, for many years. So it's not something that's super great idea that we've only just thought of. These things have been talked about for such a long time. I was expecting something a little bit more innovative and not just throwing extra technology at, at a problem. Um, we'll see. But I guess for me, there's a lot of positive points there, there's a lot of really good things about the Ultimaker 3 and I'm really excited to see more people using it, see what people are doing with it, making sure this support material and the dual head jiggle system works as well, all the different um, modes that it's got for sort of indicating things, it's got coloured lights, LEDs that come on and tell you whether you need to uh, seat the the heads in, a, in correctly or that sort of thing, so we'll see all of that over the next few days sort of come out a little bit more and people talking about it. The big thing is the price and for me that's probably the biggest disappointment. I was really really hoping that they could keep it under around two and a half thousand US dollars and it's just a lot more than that. I'll put the actual prices up on the video right now here but it's really quite quite high from my perspective and I think it's because Ultimaker are now targeting these at the firm sort of prototyping market. So they're saying this is a professional prototype, a machine that you're going to use in a office or design agency. It's not necessarily for makers as the older Ultimaker and the Ultimaker 2 is. Unless you've got lots of money. It's something I won't be able to afford. I struggled to buy a second-hand Sigma which was a very very good deal, very good value for money um, and that, that machine is quite significantly priced lower and gives the same capabilities. It's got dual extrusions and it can do a similar sort of thing. So time will tell whether people react, how people react to that, or whether it's just going to be one of those Apple-like products where everyone just decides they must have it and that's the price they're going to have to pay. So I'm going to be looking with interest to see what feedback we get on the pricing from people who are actually you know, willing to put that much money into a desktop 3D printer. Okay, that's all I can think of for now. If you've got any comments or any feedback or any questions that you might like me to talk about, uh, either on this printer or other things, then just leave me a comment below or fire it across at RipTrap3D on Twitter. I'll see you again next time. Thanks ever so much for listening.